Good morning, everyone. Want to offer a welcome to everyone who made it here through a rather foggy uh, autumn morning, and also to everyone who's watching us by virtue of video and Facebook. Appreciate having all of you here. Uh, we are apparently running a new setup on our video system, so uh, admire the new technology, those, those who are set up to do so. Uh, are there any other announcements that need to go to the congregation? Obviously, Karen is not here. She will be back Wednesday, I believe. Hearing none, please join me in the call to worship, followed by the opening prayer. Come and worship, everyone on earth, everywhere the sun shines. Let's praise God together. For listening when we call, answering our prayers, forgiving our mistakes, and providing what we need. Let's praise God together. Come and worship, everyone on earth, everywhere the sun shines. Let's praise God together. O God, we gather together in your presence with expectation, hungry for an encounter with you, eager to hear your word. Open our eyes and ears to the presence of your Holy Spirit. May the seeds of your word scattered among us this morning fall on fertile soil. May they take root in our hearts and lives and produce an abundant harvest of good words and deeds. 
We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our teacher and our Lord. Amen. The hymn is number 43, and my thanks to Janice for leading us. join me in the prayer of confession. Loving Father, when we have done what is wrong and displeasing in your sight, O Lord, extend your love to correct us. When we ignore those in need and pretend that all is right with the world, O Lord, help us to face the truth. When we turn a blind eye to those who have been stricken with poverty, and are facing the injustices that come along with it. O oh Lord, teach us your way. Enable us to extend your love and give us undivided hearts that we may fear your name. We will praise you, O oh Lord our God, with all our hearts, and we will glorify your name forever. Amen. The good news of Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with awareness of our faults, we are given grace to grow and courage to continue the journey. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now's the time for passing the peace remotely. So everybody wave, wave at the camera. It's good to see everybody here. And it's good to know that there are more here. I'll be singing the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> that was either a warm-up earlier or something that will crack my voice. We'll see what happens. <laughs> okay. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Join me in the prayer for illumination. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We have two readings today. The first is from the prophecy of Hosea. Sound the trumpet in Gibeah, the horn in Ramah. Raise the battle cry in Beth Aven. Lead on, O Benjamin. Ephraim will be laid waste on the day of reckoning. Among the tribes of Israel, I proclaim what is certain. Judah's leaders are like those who move boundary stones. I will pour out my wrath on them like a flood of water. Ephraim is oppressed, trampled in judgment, intent on pursuing idols. I am like a moth to Ephraim, like rot to the people of Judah. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his sores, then Ephraim turned to Assyria and sent to the great king for help. But he is not able to cure you, not able to heal your sores. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, like a great lion to Judah. I will tear them to pieces and go away. I will carry them off with no one to rescue them. Then I will go back to my place until they admit their guilt. And they will seek my face in their misery, they will earnestly seek me. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us, and on the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. My judgments flashed like lightning upon you. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now, our second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. 
So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. A couple of fairly heavy readings. Let's see what we can make of them. Today's New Testament reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, and it's a parable. We have three versions of it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, so it must be important. Jesus told it to us late during the week of his trial and crucifixion. He was in the temple area, and he was surrounded by officials and also by the people of Jerusalem. The officials hated him, and the people loved him, so there was a standoff. During the standoff, Jesus could say things that had a sharp point. So visualize him in the open-air setting of the stony temple court, the fires of sacrifice burning in front of the temple nearby. He started out, listen to another parable. There was a landlord, landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. There's two things to, we, that we should know here. First, vineyards full of grapes don't happen after a few hours with a planter. Vines take at least three years before they bear enough fruit to matter. Sometimes they take longer. During that time, you have to build a, a wall, a brick wall, to keep people from stealing the grapes, and a tower for the person who is guarding the grapes to watch from and sleep in. To make wine, you have to extract and store the grape juice, so you have to dig a pit and rig up a press and lay in wineskins. There's a lot to do while waiting your three years. The landowner had done all of that. The hard work was all done. All the hired hands had to do was tend the good work and harvest the results. The second thing we need to know is that everyone in the temple court had heard something like this story before. A famous prophecy from Isaiah started exactly this way. It's in Isaiah chapter 5. In Isaiah, the vineyard, after all that work, refuses to yield any grapes. That's what the crowd would have been expecting to hear when Jesus told the story. But Jesus put a twist on it. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a long journey. Now you can't rent out a vineyard that isn't working. So this story is taking a new path. It would be a familiar path to many hired workers in the crowd. In Jesus' time, much of the land around Jerusalem for many miles was owned by absentee landlords. These were rich Romans and rich Greeks and some rich Jews. They had taken the land years ago, but graciously hired the descendants of those who once had owned the land to work for them. Hired workers got a share, but gave a bigger share to the owner and the owner's vast household of family and followers and servants. When harvest time approached, the owner sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized the servants, beat one, killed another, stoned a third. Aha, the listeners in the temple might say, Isaiah's bad vineyard has turned into a vineyard full of bad workers. The priests and officials among the crowd could not have found it funny the way this story was going. They owned some of that rented land. But some of the poor people in the crowd snickered at the thought of beating up rent collectors. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Now in stories, things tend to come in threes. Now we've had two rounds of servants. What comes third? Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. The crowd took a breath, all of them. This was starting to get ugly. 
But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir, come let's kill him. And they did. The people of Jerusalem weren't happy that their land had been taken many centuries ago, but they weren't murderous people. All could see that this story was not ending happy. Jesus ended it with a question. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what do you think he'll do to those tenants? And all the people immediately replied, he will bring them to a wretched end. He'll rent the vineyard to other tenants and they will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. The parable ends here. The gospel goes on and Jesus adds some extra material that is outside the parable. We will get to that in a bit. But what we, what, what we read is the whole parable and we need to look at it carefully to see what we can learn. So what do we make of this grim little story? It was not completely unrealistic. A scholar once sorted through old court records from ancient Egypt and other nearby lands and compiled a list of cases involving vineyards. Underpaid tenants and greedy absentee landlords really did get violent. But what did Jesus mean by telling this parable? One interpretation is that Jesus was giving a prophecy of what might happen if the Jewish people rebelled against Rome. The vineyard in this case would be Judea, the absentee landlord, Caesar. In this case, the ungrateful tenants might be the crowd listening. Jesus is warning them now that Judea has been taken over by a Roman governor, Caesar's own son, that rebellion will turn out very badly. This crowd may have listened. Forty years later, they didn't. But now that the story is in the gospel, it is impossible to miss a bigger interpretation. The owner who plants the vineyard is God, just as he is in Isaiah. The servants would be the prophets. We all know who is the son. In a very short time, some people and most of the officials in the crowd would scream, crucify him. So when those same people said, he will bring those wretches to a terrible end, they did not know that they were condemning themselves. If anything, that makes the parable even more grim. We leave this parable with two questions. The first question is, what is with those crazy tenants? Do they really think that if they kill the owner's son, the owner will just go away or give up? That they had no mercy is bad enough. But did they not know the owner well enough to see that they were destroying themselves? The second question is, What's with the crazy owner? His own servants had just been abused and some of them killed twice. Why was he sending his son without a guard of soldiers or something to sweetly reason with these murderers? Why didn't the owner have more sense and just wipe out the tenants after their first murder? To help us understand our grim parable, let's turn to our second reading from prophet Hosea. You may have noticed, comparing what I read with the screen, that different translations give us different words. That's because our text of the book of Hosea is copies of copies made on ancient Xerox machines a few too many times. Some of it is very hard to read. Translators do their best with it, and we can always get the gist. Here's just a little background. When Hosea was a prophet, the Israeli people still owned their land. They had not yet been exiled, but they were not doing a very good job tending God's vineyard. Their country was split in two, a northern part and a southern part. The biggest tribe in the north was Ephraim, the biggest tribe in the south, Judah, and those became the names of two Israelite countries. 
Two very little countries are very vulnerable. The great king of Assyria, the superpower of the day, spotted that weakness right away. The Assyrian army was on the move. So Ephraim joined in a coalition with other small countries to stop the Assyrians. Well, since Ephraim was in and Judah didn't like Ephraim, Judah refused to join the coalition. So even though both were threatened by a superpower, Ephraim decided to attack Judah to force them to join. That sounds foolish. It gets worse. Whenever Ephraim and Judah were arguing, one way to win around was for one tribe of Israel to sneak off to the great king of Assyria and try to get the great king to invade the other tribe. And beyond this, both kingdoms were breaking God's laws, showing no mercy to the poor, stealing property. They worshipped idols, and they worshipped what the idols stood for. Gods who did not care about right or wrong. Gods who could be fooled by lies. Gods who could be bought off with a small sacrifice. They knew all about that kind of God, they knew nothing about their own God. All in all, the people that God had sent to watch over his vineyard weren't doing such a great job. Instead of tending a well-built farm with the buildings in good order, the people had split it down the middle and were fighting over the pieces. So God sent Hosea the prophet. Hosea starts by imitating both sides' battle cries in the border towns. Sound the trumpet in Gibeah. Oh yes, blow the horn in Ramah. Raise the battle cry in beth -Avon. Lead on, Benjamin. All of this is very thrilling, but with their attention gained, Hosea tells people what their stupidity will soon bring. Ephraim will be laid waste on a day of reckoning. Among the tribes of Israel, I proclaim what's certain. Judah's leaders are like those who move boundary stones, which is a way of saying they steal land by moving the fences at night. Turning up the tone a notch, Hosea makes it clear he's speaking God's words. In first person, hear God speak. I will pour out my wrath on them like a flood of water. I am like a moth to Ephraim, like rot to the people of Judah. God is reminding his two peoples that things come from him even if they come slowly. The steady weakening of both kingdoms, like the work of closet moths and dry rot, is not just something that happens, it's something sent by an offended God. God continues to speak. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his sores, then Ephraim turned to Assyria. They sent to the great king for help. He is not able to cure you, not able to heal your sores. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, a great lion to Judah. And then I will go back to my place until they admit their guilt. The great king is a terrible menace. But through Hosea, God tells his workers that he is a much bigger menace. In the end, even the armies of the great king are only the tools of Israel's Lord. And after those tools have done their work, Israel's Lord, like an absentee landlord, will settle back and see if his wicked tenants have learned their lesson. This pattern repeats all through the Old Testament. God supports the people, and they become safe and wealthy. Then they become arrogant, grumbling, and merciless. They walk past true prophets in order to listen to lying ones. Finally, God sends disasters. Then and only then they repent, at which point God can bless them again. Having declared disaster, God moves on and tells the people he's waiting for their next step. They will seek my face 
In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. God already knows what they will say. Come, let us return to the Lord. He will heal us. He will bind up our wounds. But listen to the sound of the rest. God speaking is letting us hear what he hears. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Oh, let us press on to acknowledge him. Yes, indeed, God will fix everything up in 48 hours. God will do what Israel wants so quickly that we can be poetic about it. As surely as the sun rise, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. In a true apology, the one who's sorry shouldn't assume that they'll be forgiven. And an offer to make amends should be an offer, not an expectation. Can we hear the flaw in Israel's so poetic repentance? God certainly heard the flaw, and he replies with some ironic poetry of his own. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. God has seen this cycle of quick repentance and even quicker re-sinning all too many times. Through the prophet, God's been speaking all along. All these words of repentance put in Israel's mouth. All that, he will heal us. On the third day, he will restore us. He will come to us like the rains. That's God talking for his people. God is being sarcastic about Israel's repentance. Now, when you go to God and start to repent, and God interrupts you and says, sure, sure, heard it all before, you are in deep trouble. We don't want God to feel sarcastic when we repent. But there's more than mockery here. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Can we hear anguish, frustration? Looking at his people, God feels the sorrow and worry of a parent with a willful and self-destructive child. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I kill you with the words of my mouth. My judgments flash like lightning. God has been harsh with his people, but not as harsh as he could be. His cutting has been with prophets, his killing with words, his anger light overhead. He does not want to destroy this people with cruelty or with sarcasm. He wants them to get it. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Our first question from the parable of the wicked tenants was, what was up with those tenants? Hosea's answer isn't very satisfactory, but it's really accurate. Hosea's answer is, guess what? This happens all the time. Foolishness and plain old evil never end. Hosea also offers help with our second question. What was up with the landlord? Was he stupid? Didn't he care about his son? Hosea tells us, the landlord's not stupid. He cares deeply. He knows full well what's going on. But the landlord is ever patient, even in frustration. The landlord never hurts the wicked tenants as much as they deserve. Because the landlord loves those tenants. It's his love that the tenants think is stupidity. God's love shows through even when God is forced to be harsh. We see a little of it even in today's most cutting passage. In the middle of Israel's false repentance, right where God mocks Israel's careless apology, there is embedded a treasure. 
After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will restore us. There's a hidden message here. For who was it that was restored on the third day? Who was it that rose again, soon to live in the Father's presence in a little less than 48 hours? Even God's most cutting sarcasm contains within it words that prophesy our Savior's resurrection. Jesus finished the parable of the wicked tenants, as we just read. But soon after, beyond the parable, Jesus added some words. He added a proverb. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Outside the parable, Jesus is telling us that the son, the son of the patient landowner, though killed by the tenants, will be raised up. Like the hidden message in Hosea, Jesus' added words give us hope after a very grim parable. So what do we take away from this? Looks like there's two lessons. The first one is pretty obvious. Don't be like those tenants. <laughs> Certainly don't, pe don't beat people up and kill them. In fact, don't even be rude or unjust or snarky. Don't be evil is a good slogan for Google or for any of us. But there's a deeper lesson here, one I hope we don't need too often, but that we will all need at some point. Every once in a while, a day comes when we discover, horrified, that we are a wicked tenant. We didn't realize. We meant better. But then we see that we abused something good that was given to us. We wasted a good gift. We skipped maintenance on a car or a house or our health. Now the doctor holds the diabetes test or the chest x-ray and tells us that the next few months are gonna hurt. Or worse yet, God trusted us with friends, or with children, or with older relatives, and we finally see that we have not treated them the way we should. We have not said words we should have said, or set the example we should have set, or spent the time we needed to spend. We hardly dare think about it, but when we do, we are ashamed. We ruined a rich vineyard. Those wrongs have consequences. We are going to be pitched out of our ruined vineyard. We must now go serve the great king for a while. Our mistakes cannot be waved away with a few quick words of repentance. Today's lesson is that God loves us even when we are stupid. Jesus the Son is willing to die for us, even when we have been wicked. Embedded in our punishment, we find, when we look, a promise of salvation. Even when our parable is done and we are self-condemned, Jesus will add comforting words from outside our story. We are broken stones, rightly rejected by the builders. But with Christ, we will be raised up. Let's conclude the sermonizing by repeating together our affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now is the time for all of the people to gather together and pray to God collectively. Do we have joys or concerns that would be good to send? Yes, uh, my brother-in-law, Jay Voss, is still in trouble. He's uh, getting treatments every day for six weeks of the radiation. He had a mask made for his brain cancer. So Jay Voss is in Chicago, my brother-in-law. Just continue prayers, please. Thanks. Anything else? All right, let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we begin by thanking you for all the good things you have given us. And by things, we emphatically include all the good people you have given us. All the people who have taught us, who have befriended us, who have given us a chance to show your love. And when we pray in petition, Lord, our prayer includes a note of thanks that we have something to petition about. Father in heaven, together we raise up those who are sick, those who are struggling. And in particular, we raise up Jay Voss as he fights cancer. He's not the only one, Lord. And people in this congregation, both in this building and remotely, each raise up to you those people who need your healing touch for physical ills or mental ills or spiritual ills. We ask that you heal them all. Father in heaven, special healing is needed for the plague of COVID-19 that is troubling our world. We raise up to you those people that are struggling with the disease, including our president and our first lady. We ask you to heal them and to provide them with strength of both body and mind and spirit. We also ask you to help those who are at home and struggling with isolation. They too need your help. Through this disease, which we must endure, we ask that you teach us patience and endurance and a faith in your providence to make things come out better in the end. Also, Lord, on this October 4th, we are within a month of our election. And we ask for your grace toward our somewhat confused country. We have always needed your grace, and this election season we need it again. We ask that you will grant us in this coming month wisdom and calm. Heavenly Father, we pray for our Pastor Karen. We ask that her time off will be helpful to her, helpful to her family, renewing to all of them, so that we may have her back with us in good spirits. Heavenly Father, there are many things we need, and there are many things we need to praise you for. And we ask that you listen to all the voices raised up to you, knotted together in this single prayer, the prayer of a faithful people. And now we join together to share the prayer that you, your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As far as offering our gifts to God goes, my job is to point out that we have boxes 
and to thank you very much for everything you've been able to donate in an economically rough year. Uh, the church understands that, but the church also could use some money to conduct business, so we appreciate everything you can do. Our final hymn, then, is number 526. God has brought us together, some in person and some with electronics, brought us all together to hear his word and be refreshed on this Sunday. Now we go out into the other days to serve our Lord and keep his commandments. Amen. <laughs>